Okay, and I'm Edda. I'm a first year PhD student in Sutherland Lab at Duke University. And today I want to talk to you about modeling neurodevelopmental disorders um, in mice. Uh, with advances in sequencing technologies, genetic testing and clinical studies, and these large-scale genomic projects have become widespread in generating a list of genes that are implicated in neurodevelopmental disorders such as ADHD, epilepsy, autism spectrum disorder, and intellectual disability. And while these studies are really useful, we are still lacking the comprehensive understanding of molecular and cellular mechanisms leading to disease caused by disruptions to these genes. So, and this understanding is absolutely required for the development of novel and efficient therapies. And I think to bridge this gap, we really have to be able to do functional studies. And for this, we really need good in vivo models that have constructed space and predictive validity. And I think this will offer a better understanding of both what goes wrong in a disease state, but also will provide valuable insights into the biology of the brain. And in Sutherland Lab, we use a mouse as a model system, and we are specifically interested in synaptic genes that are important for neural function and um, implicated in neurodevelopmental disorders. So when I first uh, started my PhD, I really got interested in this one synaptic gene called CNKSR2, which essentially had unknown function. But interestingly, in the past seven to eight years, there has been many clinical studies published um, showing that the loss of function mutations in CNKSR2 causes syndrome called epilepsy aphasia. So epilepsy aphasia is a spectrum of disorders in which epilepsy and language um, disorders overlap. And at the severe end of the spectrum are the Lando clafter syndrome and also the continuous spike and wave during slow wave sleep syndrome. And this syndrome is characterized by seizures that occur in three out of four children, EEG abnormalities during sleep, cognitive abnormalities, and uh, progressive aphasia, which is the loss of language skills. And as far as the treatment goes, so seizures in this chil these children are treated with anti-seizure medications. However, these medications are not really effective when it comes to like, the cognitive impairments. And unfortunately, around eight of 10 children are left with permanent language and cognitive difficulties. So there is definitely a need for better treatments, which require a better understanding of the pathogenesis. So to be able to study the effects of CNKSR loss in vivo, we generated a CNKSR to knockout mouse line. And initial characterization of these mice show that, um, that they were overly healthy and viable. And next I wanted to ask, does the loss of CNKSR2 uh, cause neural dysfunction in mice? And for the interest of time, I just want to highlight the most interesting phenotypes in these mice. So one of the things I've done was to um, record EEGs. So for these experiments, I implant electrodes sitting on the cortex in the brain and the EMG wire is going under the neck muscle to um, record muscle activity. So the setup looks something like this. So I record 24 hour long EEGs in freely moving mice um, and, I can record, and then I can analyze the EEG activity and also search for um, any seizure um, events. And very excitingly here, I saw that the CNKSR2 knockout mice have um, spontaneous seizures and they also have overly um, increased EEG brain activity. And I was also curious about the behavioral changes in these mice and I want to share one of the behavior experiments with you. So some of you might know that rodents produce ultrasonic vocalizations in a variety of situations for either communication or as a result of their physical state. And uh, even though these vocalizations are um, innate, they are widely used in the studies of human communication and associated disorders. So in order to address whether CNKSR2 knockout might display any deficits in communication, I recorded and analyzed um, in these uh, vocalizations in wild type and knockout mice. And first was, um, first experimental setup was during maternal separation. Um, experiments in which pups are separated from their moms briefly, and then they start calling, um, mainly because they're cold. And here, um, I didn't really see a big difference between genotypes, but when I aged these mice and, and looked at a different context, which is uh, during courtship, in which a male mouse is producing vocalizations when he's put near a female mouse, I saw that the, there was a dramatic decrease um, in the vocalizations of the knockout mice. So it seems to be per, um, maybe a progressive loss of ultrasonic vocalizations. And one of the benefits of using mouse as a model is that we have many standardized you know, behavioral paradigms 
and setups um, in the field. So, and this one is called Moist Water Maze. And I like to show this task to people who are not familiar with uh, mouse behavior, because I think it's um, kind of fun actually. So Moist Water Maze is um, essentially a giant swimming pool for mice. And while mice are really good swimmers, they don't like it much. And there's a hidden platform in the pool. So when they can, when they find it, they can actually rest on it. But to be able to find this hidden platform, they should learn the spatial cues around the room to be like locate the platform. So when we look at a wild type mouse, um, you're gonna see that um, this guy has learned where the hidden platform is very well. So he's quite fast at finding the platform. But when we compare it to a knockout mouse, which you're gonna see, okay, it's coming. The knockout mice have, you know, kind of trouble finding the platform because they're they're worse at learning the location. So which suggest they have deficits in um, learning. And this is, this video is going to go on for a while because this mouse especially was um, bad at it. <laughs> but, and lastly, going from behavior to molecular level, I want to just talk about the, what, what could be the potentially molecular role of this protein CNKSR2. So other previous in vitro studies suggested that this um, protein CNKSR2 can act as a scaffolding protein at the synapse anchoring other proteins. So what I wanted to do was to see if the loss of CNKSR2 would cause any changes in the proteins of the synapse or synaptic proteome. And for this, I use a quantitative discovery proteomics approach in which I dissect out hippocampus and cortex, and I biochemically purify synaptic proteome. And then I use uh, this technique called tandem mass tag labeling uh, to label different samples from wild type and knockout, then I can detect and quantify the peptides, and then I can get a relative quantification of different proteins between wild type and knockout. After doing this experiment, I look at the proteins that were significantly up or down regulated in the knockout condition compared to the wild type. And here I plot that um, this protein interaction map. So each node is a uh, protein that was dysregulated in my knockout. And the lines mean that uh, these proteins have been shown to interact with each other. So I saw that there were 14 dysregulated protein in the knockouts, and three of them being CNKSR2 interactors based on previous literature. And they seem to be um, implicated in small GTPA signaling. And strikingly, eight of these 14 proteins were implicated in either epilepsy or intellectual disability, and some of the other proteins were either mitochondrial or metabolic uh, proteins. So these uh, results show that the loss of CNKSR2 results in the depletion of its synaptic binding partners, which I think is very consistent with its proposed role as a scaffolding uh, protein, but also the other interesting hits that may single-handedly or in combination may underlie the phenotypes I observe, which is something we're looking into. So to summarize, by generating and extensively characterizing this uh, mouse knockout line, I think now we have a pretty good even model to study epilepsy aphasia syndrome. And the other aspects of my work that I didn't really have time today to talk about is I've been doing other things to really understand the cellular and molecular basis uh, of this disease. And I think we are really getting close to having an idea of how the mutations in this gene can cause this syndrome by utilizing this now mouse model. And I think with that, I just want to thank my lab, my collaborators, my thesis committee, and our funding. And I, again, want to thank the organizers for having me today. I'll take any questions.